In this last section on children in the courtroom, I'm going to share with you some studies that I did and my graduate students have done over the years uh, addressing some issues specifically uh, when children are in the courtroom in, in terms of what juries think, how to better prepare them, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things I noticed in the early 90s, this, I'm going to share with you a study I did in, early, in the early 90s. One of the things I um, noticed at that time was that there, were a lot of, there was a lot of confusion as to whether jurors believe children or not. Some studies reported that no, uh, children are less believed than adults. Other studies said, no, actually, they're believed more than adults. And also, if you looked at some of these court cases, there were some cases where, even though there was no evidence, uh, the jury convicted in other cases where it just didn't make any sense. Well, one of the things I noticed that was different about both the real court cases and the research studies was the age of the kids that were testifying. And so I wanted to do a little bit more work looking at how age impacted uh, mock jurors' decisions. So here's the study that I'm telling you about. So how do jurors vote when there's a case that hinges on the child's testimony? So what I did was I varied the age of the child based on most of the literature. What you saw is that some of the kids were around 9 or 10, then you would saw 5 or 6, 12 or 13. So I picked 6, 9, and 12-year-old victim. And the other uh, variable that I varied was whether or not there was some corroboration for what the child was saying. So remember I told you before that prior to the 80s that children could not testify unless there was some kind of corroborating evidence? And so I wanted to look at how corroboration uh, might impact people's decisions. So basically, here's the case. This is a case, this young lady, Catherine Potter, she was walking through the park on her way from home from school when she was stopped by a man who claimed to have lost his injured dog and asked her for help. So of course, she agrees to help. And when the man got her around the building in a private area, he assaulted her. Okay. Uh, and in this particular case, Catherine Potter identified the defendant in a lineup. Okay, so basically you've got different age kids. The, the case circumstances are exactly identical except for these two pieces. What about the corroboration? So here's how we, uh, I varied the corroboration. Uh, in the corroboration condition, there was a witness that saw Catherine Potter talking to the defendant in the park on the day and time in question. So what that does, it, it doesn't provide, you know, a smoking gun proof, but it does support Catherine Potter's story. It doesn't mean that she was sexually assaulted, but it certainly suggests that she saw that man in the park and spoke to him. So what I was curious about is whether or not uh, the number of guilty verdict, verdicts in the case would differ depending on the age of the child or the corroboration condition. And here's what I found. Take a look. As you can see, corroboration definitely helps. So the blue is the corroborated cases, and you'll see that the percentage of guilty verdicts increases when there's some kind of corroboration, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, the funny thing, though, is that this, you see a, a, diff a slight difference here in this nine-year-old between the corroborated and uncorroborated. Those were not statistically significant. In other words, the nine-year-old uh, was about as good in the uncorroborated condition as in the corroborated, suggesting that the nine-year-old didn't need any backup evidence. Interesting thing, if you look at this pattern here, this 12-year-old um, in the uncorroborated condition is giving the least amount of guilty verdicts. Now, if you look at blame to the victim, so why is it that they're not giving guilty verdicts in that 12-year-old case? And here's what you can see. Um, the older child is being blamed more for the assault than the younger children, especially in that uncorroborated case. You see there, um, this was the case right here, the 12-year-old child in the uncorroborated, uncorroborated case had the fewest guilty verdicts. And it's possibly because the jurors place more blame on that 12-year-old's behavior. Uh, she should have known better, I guess, which of course we know is simply not true. Uh, to ask a 12-year-old to be as wary as a six-year-old or more wary is, is not totally reasonable, okay? But certainly what this suggested was that age does matter. And interestingly enough, 
it was the 12 year old that seemed to be at a disadvantage, not the nine or the six year old. Okay. So having done that, I decided to follow up with a study that just varied age only. So this was the corroboration case. So I used the same case, but all I did was change the age of the victim, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, because I wanted to see whether or not this pattern that I saw in the first study, uh, whether it was true that there seems to be a decline in age uh, in terms of the number of guilty verdicts, but an increase in blame. And so what did I find? Here I'm going to just show you the percentage of guilty verdicts. And, you know, in, in statistics, what we try to do is draw a line. And you can see what you'd probably do is draw a negative line so that the older the child, the fewer guilty verdicts in this case. Interestingly enough, when I did looked at victim blame, I found exactly the opposite. The older the child, the more blame. So I went back to some of the previous studies to see whether in fact this was what I'm finding other people were finding. And that is the case. It seems like when you have very, very young children, they tend to be believed, but older children tend to be less believed. And it may be because jurors uh, place more blame on them for their own victimization, which I think is really interesting because often we talk about young children, but certainly it seems that maybe the older children are at a disadvantage, at least with regard to jurors. Okay, so that was one study that I did. I'd like to share with you another study that my graduate student, Cami London, and I did. And this was looking at what we call truth lie ceremonies. Remember I told you before in the, when we talked, looked at the NICHD protocol, I said that you want that um, there's usually a truth lie ceremony. Well, a truth lie ceremony is something that prosecuting attorneys want to see as part of an interview, okay? Um, what you do is you show that the child understands the difference between a truth and a lie. And then once the child shows you that they know the difference, they have to assent to tell the truth, okay? I should tell you that most of these truth lie ceremonies are extremely short. So for example, somebody, um, right now I am wearing a white shirt and a truth lie ceremony sometimes will go like this. Mary, um, if I told you that I was wearing a black shirt, is that a truth or a lie? And she'd say, that's a lie because I'm wearing a white shirt. And let's say the child is wearing a pink shirt. And what if I told you that you're wearing a pink shirt? Is that a truth or a lie? And she say, she would say, that's the truth. And then I would say, well, good, Mary. Now I want you to know that we're going to be talking right now. I, wa I want you to promise me that you'll tell the truth. Will you promise to tell the truth? And the child usually says yes. That's a truth lie ceremony. It's very quick, uh, very um, simple. It mainly shows the court that the child understands the difference between a truth and a lie and that they promise to tell the truth. The question that Cammie had, of course, was whether or not truth lies ceremonies actually encourage truthfulness. Uh, just because a child now assents to tell the truth, will they actually tell the truth? Also, the other thing that she was interested in is uh, doing a better truth lie ceremony. Because if you simply ask kids about if my shirt is white or black, is your shirt red? That's a very um, simplistic definition of truth. And so Cammie devised a longer truth lie ceremony too. So what she was interested in is whether truth lie ceremonies in any regard encourage truthfulness and then whether a longer one that picked up some of the nuances of truthfulness, if that would help. Okay, so what she did, um, she got uh, 120 kids from four to six years old uh, the average age was 63 months, uh, had 51 girls and 67 boys. There were no sex differences, so we collapsed across um, across sex. So let me tell you about the task because it was very clever. The task was a little game, okay? There's Cami. She's sitting at the table, and she plays a game with the child. What she does is what, uh, has the child turn around. She puts a little animal into the barn and closes the door. and what she says is we're going to play a little game and every single time you get a right answer, you get win a prize. So what happens on the first one, it's a very simple little prize. So let's say a little sticker 
And by the way, kids will do anything for stickers. So, um, so she says, okay, what I have in the barn goes moo. And then, so can you tell me what animal it is? And of course the child says cow. So she opens the barn door and takes out the cow and sure enough, it's a cow. And she gives the child a sticker. So then she does the second one, but she shows the child a better prize, uh, a slightly larger toy, something really cool. And she says, okay, we're gonna do it again. And she has the child turn around, the animal goes in the barn and she says, okay, can you guess this animal? This animal goes oink, oink, oink. And the child guesses pig. Sure enough, it's a pig and the child gets a prize. So now there's real excitement in the air here. And she tells the child, well, the next one's going to be harder, but here's the prize. And of course, she pulled out the most amazing prize of all. Uh, the child's eyes light up and it's like, oh my gosh, I got to get this one right. So just at the time that Cammie announces this last prize and says that this last task is going to be a little harder, a confederate walks into the lab and says, Cammie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So what she's done, she's put the last animal in there. She had the child turn around, put the last animal in there and shut the door. And that's when the Confederate walks in. Cammy, I'm sorry I, uh, to interrupt you, but you got an important phone call and they said that you need to come right away. So what Cammy does is she looks at the child and she says, I'm really sorry I have to leave, but if you get this last one right, here's your prize. Again, uh, emphasizing the prize. And so she says, I've got to leave and get this phone call. Don't peek. Okay, don't peek and we'll do this last one when I get back. So what we've done, of course, is we've set the children up because what happened 85% of the time was peeking, okay? So told the child not to peek. And of course, as soon as Cammie left, we had all the kids on closed circuit TV and the parents were sitting in another room um, watching their kids peek, okay? So we, we've sort of set them up to do something dishonest. So what happens then is Cammie comes back in and she goes to sit down and she says, we're going to do the last one, okay? Um, and so she runs through it and it was something like, I don't remember what the last one was. It was a little bit more difficult, but not too difficult. Uh, maybe cluck, 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 and they guessed chicken and they got the prize, okay? Well, then Cammie said, I want you to tell my friend, another uh, confederate comes in here. I want you to tell my confederate, uh, my friend here about the game that you just played. Okay. So that's when she leaves the room. And that's when the interview takes place. And of course, the important question is going to be, did you peek? So here's the way we uh, did this. So half of the kids got a truth ceremony. Okay and half of the kids got no truth ceremony. So in other words, the interview started without a uh, the little short or long truth ceremony and an assent to tell the truth. So we had either short or long, okay? And by the way, in the no truth session, there was just an introduction to the interview that we're gonna be talking about things and I'm gonna be asking you questions, so forth and so on, okay? So basically what we're doing is, does the truth ceremony help and is the long one better than the short one? And so here are the results. So one of the most important parts of this interview that the child goes through, the uh, interviewer asks the child about the first animal, the second animal, and she says, oh, and didn't Cammie have to leave the room? Did she tell you not to peek? And of course, all the children said yes. And then the vital question comes in, did you peek? Okay, so will the child fess up to peeking? So I'm gonna share the results with you and I'm going to show you the percentage of children who said, no, they didn't peak. In other words, they deceived, okay? Here's the percentage of children who said they didn't peak, even though we know they did, uh, by the short and long and truth and no truth. So let me just take you through this. Obviously, I think the one thing that you should notice is that doing a truth lie ceremony of any kind and probably the main important thing is getting the child to promise to tell the truth. It really does help the children to tell the truth. Okay. When you don't get that promise from them, look at 90% uh, 
of the kids, uh, you know, 85 to 95, 90% of the kids will lie and say that they didn't peak. But by simply doing this truth life ceremony, you got kids to um, tell the truth more often. And spending a little bit more time talking about the difference between a truth and a lie uh, did seem to help, although it wasn't as great as we had hoped. But the big thing is that just getting kids to assent, to promise to tell the truth, and doing even a short lie ceremony was helpful in getting them to tell the truth. So that's why tooth lie ceremonies are an important part of any forensic interview protocol. Uh, prosecutors want to see that in there so that there's, um, when that tape is shown in court, there's an assent, the child has promised to tell the truth, and we have data to suggest it does help. Okay, so one last thing I want to uh, talk to you about is when kids testify in the court, uh, they're sometimes... Uh, they sometimes get some pretty complex questions from attorneys on both sides of the aisle. Um, let me just show you one case. This is probably the most egregious case in terms of comprehension. This was a true case of a nine-year-old little girl who had allegedly been a, an adult attempted to abduct her. She managed to get away and the person jumped in the car and drove away, but she actually had the wherewithal to look at the license plate and remember the license plate number. The person who tried to abduct her was arrested and brought to trial. But during trial, one of the attorneys repeatedly confront her, confronted her with totally convoluted questions. Here are some of the questions this poor little girl got. You don't know if any of your brothers or sisters, or if I was your brother, well, any of your brothers or sisters didn't really tell what happened, didn't quite tell the truth once. You don't know, any, know of any of that happening in your family. I don't know quite what he's getting at. Maybe he's seeing whether anybody in the family ever lies. Did you just pick that up just because you talk, you plan your time to fill your space, the spacing off or riding your bike, or did anybody tell you you should read license plates? Okay, uh, what to say? Prior to seeing Mr. B in his front yard on that night, that day, and the individual in the car, did you ever see Mr. B get into his car before that or get out of his car? <laughs> Again, these were actual questions that this little nine-year-old was getting. So children, once they get into the court, even if they have a good, they've gone through good interviews and they haven't been misled by any adults, they might have some difficult time in the courtroom. And there are lots of different faulty questions that have been identified by other researchers. So for example, yes, no questions. When kids get straightforward. Did you do this? Yes or no? Uh, you find that there tends to be biases. So two-year-olds tend to have a yes bias. They tend to say yes to things even when the answer should be no. So knowing that if you've got a young child on the stand, asking a lot of yes, no questions is probably not a good, good idea. The other thing that we notice is that four and five-year-olds have a no bias when they can't understand the question. So if you go back to the, uh, did anybody, if we could even get through the first part of that second piece, this piece right here, if you just take the last part, did anybody tell you you should read license plates? That's a yes or no question. That seems pretty straightforward. But this other one, did you ever see Mr. B get into his car before that or get out of his car? That is incomprehensible. And what you see is that children four to five years old will often say no, even if, because they don't understand the question. Older children also can have difficulty with these kinds of questions, especially if they have learning problems. So that's one type of faulty question. Another one uh, is questions that are grammatically complex or have advanced vocabulary or legalese in it. So was the perpetrator occluded by any of the vehicles? Okay. At any time before or after you heard the scream, did the vehicle move backwards or forwards? Okay. Unnecessarily complex. The final type of faulty questions, and these are not the only ones, but these were the most egregious uh, that kids had a hard time with, are the negatives, double negatives, and multi-part questions. Did the man not tell you to be quiet? Uh, I don't know. Did he tell me? What does that mean? Did John not say that he would not hurt you? Again, this sort of double negative. 
And then the multi-part questions. Your kitchen at home, do you remember if you were th there earlier? Did you go out? Well, which question am I supposed to answer? So children tend to have difficulty with these kinds of questions. One study that looked at the cross-examination of kids, this was a study that looked at actual court transcripts in which five to 13 year olds uh, testified in sexual abuse cases. And what the researchers found was that the defense attorneys ask a higher proportion of those leading questions, they ask a higher proportion of the complex questions, and a higher proportion of the grammatically unsound questions. It seems like they're almost trying to trip the child up, okay? Another thing that the researchers found was that children seldom requested additional clarification. Even if they got something that was incomprehensible, they didn't say things like, I don't understand the question. And finally, uh, the last two things I think are very important. They were highly inconsistent under cross-examination. They changed their answers. These are the kinds of things that can make jurors think that the child is unreliable. And in fact, 75% of the children changed at least one aspect of the direct evidence when they were being cross-examined. And it may be, is it, is it because children are so uh, delicate, their memory is so delicate? It may be that they're not really understanding the, some of these questions, but trying to answer them anyway. So why would children change their answers under cross-examination? Obviously, one uh, possible explanation is that they fail to monitor the source of the original information, so they're getting confused, basically. Or there was a memory uh, weakening, a trace. Or it could be that children are compliant. Okay, they know that the, the attorney's asking weird questions, but they're trying to be compliant, okay? So all of these things could be there. Uh, in one study, this, which was a simulated study, they found that cross-examination actually decreased the accuracy of children whose reports were originally accurate. So they were just as likely to change from a correct response as they were an incorrect one. So cross-examination tends to be very difficult for little kids. So my one of my graduate students was very interested in possibly helping kids to do better when they're being confronted with these very difficult questions. And this was a study that was done by my student, Walt Peters, um, and myself. And he was looking at a couple of things. One is, age differences in comprehension. We already know this. Uh, older kids comprehend much better. They, they understand more words, they understand more complex sentences, et cetera. That's, that's a no-brainer. But what people have also found is that there are age differences in comprehension monitoring. What that means is your ability to know when you're confused. So one of the things that we have found is that if you give college students some of those same horrible complex questions that, that you saw earlier, a lot of times they'll look at you and go, what? That question doesn't make any sense. So they're able to understand that the question doesn't make sense and that they don't understand it. Young children don't tend to do that. They don't tend to either understand that they misunderstand and they don't stop people. And so what Walt wanted to do was to train young children in their comprehension monitoring. So what we're training then is a, uh, for kids to be able to say in a courtroom, I don't understand the question, okay? So he did a very clever little study. Um, what he did was he trained uh, some kids. So basically, let me just tell you that over a series of a couple of weeks, he trained, uh, he randomly assigned kids to one of two conditions. One is, um, what we call the traditional task demand training. When kids have to um, testify in court, they're often given some training about the courtroom itself, what the judge does, what the jury does, who sits where, just so children will feel more comfortable once they're in the courtroom. And so that's a very typical type of training. What Walt did is he randomly assigned kids to either the traditional training or the traditional training plus what he, the comprehension monitoring training. So what, what happened was children witnesses witnessed little events. This was part of the training. 
and then they were questioned about the events that they saw. So that we had these little simple videos, and then they were asked questions about what happened on the videos. Um, half of the questions that they were given were simple questions, easy to answer. What color was the shirt of the little character wearing? And some of them were complex, having those double negatives, multifaceted, so forth. And what the kids were trained to do, and it was very cute, um, they, whenever they had a question that they didn't understand, they were supposed to hold up their hand like a stop sign, like, like a police officer, and say, stop, I don't understand the question. Could you please say it a different way? Okay, we're training them to understand when they don't understand and then stop the interviewer and ask for a rephrasing. Okay, so um, this is really cute because this is Laramie. The kids who participated in this study often ran into Walt at Safeway or at Kmart or at Walmart. And for many years, uh, as soon as they saw Walt in the store, they would yell, stop. I don't understand the question. So um, they, it certainly was a memorable training for them. Okay, so one of the things that you want to do is you want kids to ask for a rephrasing. So let me give you the results uh, in terms of rephrasing. What we found was, let me just give you age-related um, findings first. Here's the age-related findings for rephrasing. As you might predict, the older kids were much more likely to say, please rephrase the question. Okay? The younger the child, the less likely you are to see an, a request for rephrasing. However, the training did work because the kids were randomly assigned to either the um, comprehension monitoring training or the traditional. And here's what you see. Okay? So let me just orient you. When kids get simple questions, for the most part, they don't ask for rephrasings. That's because they get a simple question, they understand it, and they answer it. Okay, So that's very important. If kids ask for rephrasings here, uh, that would be a little bit of a problem. However, when there was a complex question, you see that the children who got that additional training were much more likely to ask for a rephrasing. So we have success. And then we wanted to look at whether or not when a child asks for something to be rephrased, do they then, are they then more likely to get it correct? Okay, do you, do you understand the concept? Let me show you here, okay? So what we wanna know is like which training group you're in. If you're trained to, to ask for the question, are you more likely to ask for requests and then, are you more likely to get the answer correct? Okay. And one of the things that we did was we looked and we saw that, yes, um, which training group did predict uh, your correct responses? The people in the comprehension monitoring training were much more likely to get the answers correct. And that was significant. We also found that which training group you were in predicted whether you would make a request with the kids in the CMT much more likely to make requests. And then finally, if you made a request, you were much more likely to get the response correct. So this is, this is the kind of model that you're saying, okay, is the, refra is the requests, do, do the requests lead to the correct responses? And this is what we call a mediation model. What we're going to do here, and this is a little bit of fancy statistical analysis here, and I'm just going to show you the results here. But what we're interested in is, you see this right here, training predicts correct responses. So you get, you've got a significant effect right here. But if we do a model where we do this first, in other words, we say, let me account for requests and correct responses first. Does this direct effect go away? And if it does, that means that requests mediate the model. And when we ran the mediation model, what we found was the direct effect here went away. You see, it's no longer significant. So what that suggests is that the, the mechanism that gets to the correct answers is asking for those requests, which, which showed that our comp we can teach kids to monitor their comprehension, to ask for rephrasings, 
and when they ask for rephrasings, they're more likely to get a correct response. Okay? Well, that's all I've got for you today, and this is all I'm going to talk about with regard to children. Um, but there's lots more that I, we could have talked about, but I think I've hit on some of the highlights. Next time, we're on our last uh, section, and we're going to look at punishment and sentencing. Okay? Thank you.